This is Octave Leap. Innovation, regeneration, and human optimization. Hello and welcome everybody. It's so good to see you. We got people from the Netherlands, Scotland, Vancouver, Colorado, and it's always great to see such a lively bunch on the chat. I do apologize. I had some technical difficulties today. Some stuff that's never happened before, so it was a new learning experience for me. I think there's some gremlins in the machine right now. And I just want to say today is a very exciting day because we're going to be covering the third part of our series, Harmonic Geometry. Not only that, but I also have a very special guest on today that you may may recognize or you may not recognize if you're, you're new to this, but I'm just gonna bring him on just for a quick chat. He's hanging out in the back room right now. So I'm gonna bring him in just to say hi, and then I'll send him back to the waiting room. So this is our special guest for the day, Martin. <laughs> hey everyone. Hello, so just forward. a quick, Yes, just a quick hello right now as we are uh, going to do a presentation, but I can uh, pull you in and pull you out. That's kind of the fun part about this. So I'll put you back in the waiting room. You can watch with everybody else. And then Martin and I are going to be talking about lots of cool stuff and just having um, sort of a chat. We, we, we have a really good rapport when we do our informal chats. And so that's the kind of vibe we're, we're kind of going for today. So we'll see Martin again very shortly here. All right. Now for everybody else, what are we going to be covering today? Well, we're going to be covering what I find to be the most fascinating part of this, um, what we call harmonic geometry. And this is actually what I call objective music. And it's not my personal, what I call, Dave Kahn calls objective music. It's actually a thing, a thing out there. So just making sure everything's good. Yes, gremlins might be purified too. Just making sure everything's good in the chat. And we're going to dive in here, the power of objective music. All right. So without further ado, let's go. So as Pythagoras said, and I think I've said this quote every single time, the highest goal of music is to connect to one's soul to their divine nature, not entertainment. So the ancients took music and sound very, very seriously. Like I said, um, in the ancient Comitian mystery schools, there were four subjects you could study, geometry, mathematics, um, astronomy, and music, and they were all related. There was all congruence between these four major subjects. By the way, if you take those four subjects and you combine them with the trivium, which is uh, logic, grammar, rhetoric, you get the seven liberal arts. So that's the basis, the supposed basis for our modern um, post-secondary education system. Just a little bit of a historical tidbit for you. So what is objective music, right? Because people, you know, say I make spiritual music or transformational music or, you know, music that opens you up in different ways. And especially nowadays, I mean, I think there's a lot of people reading stuff on the internet and we've talked about 432 and all these healing frequencies that we see so ubiquitously out there. But is it really objective music? So, Objective music is a term coined by a fellow named G.I. Gurdjieff, who I studied quite heavily because I really, really resonated deeply with this particular man um, in his way of doing things. So he was a Russian mystic from the late 19th century, and he lived until about 1949. And his view on the subject of music, and indeed on art in general, stemmed from his differentiation between what he terms as subjective and objective. Most art and music is subjective based on a person's personality, their unconscious tendencies and habits. Only objective music is based on an exact knowledge of the mathematical laws that govern the vibration of sounds and the relationship of tones. This is really what we've been covering in weeks one and two of this, is really having an understanding of how to work with those mechanics uh, that we saw with cymatics, that we saw with harmonic resonance. In either case, the particular configurations of sounds will evoke a response in the human psyche in which the relation of the tones and their sonic qualities will be translated into some form of inner experience. This phenomenon appears to be based on a precise mathematical relationship between the properties of sound and some aspect of the receptive apparatus, which is the person. So, in short, 
It's music that actually opens up the pathways in the body and produces a transformational effect in the listener. Now, there's a lot of talk about a specific knowledge of mathematics and really understanding these mechanics of sound. But I must say, the human vessel is so rich and intricate and there's so much that it knows how to do like if we get cut it heals itself if we get sick it gets better on its own that if we're operating at a certain frequency all of that knowledge of mathematical laws and all that stuff is taken care of by the higher centers of the human being so Gurdjieff uh, actually he invented or I shouldn't say he invented he rediscovered the Enneagram that um, many people use in this personality type system that was uh, further developed by Carl Achazo in the 50s. So he actually discovered the Enneagram and it actually relates to music. So this is really really fascinating what we're going to talk about today with that. Uh, this here also relates to music but it's written very esoterically as you can see. <laughs> So again, we're going to get into this and I'm going to simplify it and I'm actually going to talk about how it relates to the all of creation. So we're going to talk about how music relates to the entire process of creation today. So who was this Gurdjieff character? Well, he was a Russian Armenian mystic who dove into the wisdom teachings of Egypt, Persia and the Hindu Kush in his early years. There's a great movie called um, Meetings, no, it's uh, In Search of the Miraculous. And um, you can find it on YouTube even. And it was made in the 70s about this. But it was basically when he was 18, he had such a thirst for truth that he took a group of friends and they actually went into, he, he discovered sort of the ancient mystical Christian sects that existed in Egypt, um, like sort of the ISIS cults and that type of thing. And then the Persian wisdom teachings. But where he finally landed was a monastery in Kyrgyzstan. And after coming back for that, he coined a system he called the fourth way or the way of the householder for the transformation of the human being. Because what he found was that essentially the three main paths were the path of the uh, yogi, which was very much you go into a cave, you use your mind, you're able to control functions happening in the body. Uh, there was the path of the monk where you kind of have to distill everything out of your reality and just go into your faith and it's your faith that sort of purifies everything but again it's a path unto its own and the third one is the the path of the fakir and a fakir is somebody who does sort of crazy stunts and so in the east you have these people that would hold their hand up over their head for 60 years and the hand would go all like gangrenous the arm would go gangrenous but it would sort of be this real sort of like ultra marathon David Goggins style transformation. You know, there'd be a couple thousand second wins that you'd pass through and you'd actually end up creating a mystical state in the process of all that. So anyway, this was sort of um, Gurdjieff's uh, approach to um, how to create this way for the everyday person. Now, of course, it's not for the everyday person. Most people just aren't interested or really... Um, you know, they don't have the capacity to really understand this. So, but it's for people who may live in a Western context as opposed to uh, an ancient Eastern context where you pretty much had to give up everything and take a path. The other thing that was interesting about him is he avoided intellectual discussions of spirituality and fo instead focusing on writing music and choreographing sacred dance, claiming that this way is the most direct way to awakening the human instrument and initiating the process of self-remembering. The reason for this is because the way that we've become conditioned and wired over time is that the brain um, is focused on survival. It's focused on the physical survival. And it's sort of this reptilian brain that becomes the master of the human being, as opposed to the higher brain, the brain that's connected with natural law and with the universe. And so there's this mechanism of actually flipping that so that the survival instinct, it's basically that brain, the reptilian brain, the brainstem, is responsible for the autonomic nervous system. So the functioning of the, you know, day-to-day -day systems in the body. And what we typically call the mind is actually able to free itself from the barrage of thoughts that are coming in, the monkey mind, the chatter, and instead focus on what is relevant in the present moment. So it's really... Uh, captivating this present moment awareness and that is remembering our true nature self-remembering 
So this is the pinnacle of his work was that there's seven tones of the major scale in Western music mirrors the seven orders of creation. This is going to get a little bit esoteric, so just bear with me. But when I was in my 20s and I was reading this stuff for the first time, I was literally having like these like mind expanding psychedelic experiences <laughs> contemplating this stuff. So what he says is that there's this thing called the ray of creation. So from the absolute unified field, for anything to manifest, it comes down this process of densification. And as it becomes more densified, it's subjected to more laws. And this is similar to where consciousness basically um, gets caught in unconscious states. If you're familiar with Hinduism, for instance, they'll talk about that the, uh, the more manifest something becomes, the more that consciousness has gone to sleep. And there's certain myths and tales that they tell about different deities in which this happens. Well, in this system, this is based on uh, Christian Gnosticism, which goes back, you know, thousands and thousands of years. Um, even, you know, said to go back well before Christianity, but also before the, um, the flood, apparently. Don't ask me. I wasn't there. But essentially, when this ray of creation happens, the creation goes from the absolute to the universe, to the galaxy level, to the sun level, to the all planets level, to the level of a particular planet, and then the lowest, most densified layer is the layer of the moon. And so Gurdjieff actually talked a lot about the moon being this artificial entity and the moon actually not being a positive thing, but sort of a control mechanism. So he talked about this a lot, and you can probably find this material in a lot of other places as well. So this is sort of the paradox between sort of uh, God and Lucifer, you could say. At this end of the creative spectrum is subjected to its imprisonment. It's hell, according to Christian Gnosticism. But it's not so much like there's an evil devil that's going to get people. It's just that one's consciousness is subjected to so many laws because it has gone into sleep, into unconsciousness. And as you'll see here, there's seven tones. And it goes, do, re, mi, fa, so, la, si, do. Now, if you know anything about music, that's exactly how musicians learn the major scale. Do, re, mi, fa, so, la, si, do. Interesting. C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C. So that's our major scale. And it's actually the, the grand octave of the major scale is the same as the octave of creation according to the Gnostics. So the basis for our Western major scale is this. That's where it comes from. Isn't that crazy? And I'll prove it to you. Because there's two evolutionary gaps that cannot be fulfilled in, a major in the cosmic octave without intervention. And you'll notice these are the two ones that do not have the black keys. They do not have a, um, a tone in between them. And so we have C, D, E, but you have a, this thing here which is called a sharp, and you have this thing here called a sharp. You don't have that here, and you don't have that here. And so how does that correlate? Well, it correlates between do, re, mi, and this is like um, one, two, three, but this is basically physical survival. So moving from the level of physical survival into awareness of the non-physical is a gap, and it's a gap most people don't cross. Most people are stuck in the solipsistic cage of the five senses. And so we need some sort of aha moment, a catalytic life experience, a mentor, or the use of objective music to bridge that first evolutionary gap between me and Fa. And then we progress into this sort of metaphysical awareness, this shamanic awareness, Fa, So, La, Si. And so you get people who can be pretty out there, you know, um, they can have this planetary awareness, this uh, sun worship, this solar consciousness, a galactic consciousness. They could be aware of these transcendental experiences, but there's another gap. And that's the gap between sort of a, the higher levels of the matrix and actually entering back into a state of oneness. And so the second gap is this one here, C Do. And again, it is bridged by a shock. So what can deliver a shock? Well, Gurdjieff said that, you know, he, he didn't actually believe in gurus and teachers and stuff like that so much. He said mentors, and especially people that are awake, they can be sort of um, people on the road for you. But he said that 
you know, life can provide that shock for you. Certain practices can provide those shocks for you, but it has to be somewhat external because what will happen otherwise is that people sort of end up going on the same level. It's like a carousel. They don't ascend the octave like a spiral staircase. Instead, they just end up going in circles. So they'll go do, re, mi, and then they'll go back to do. You know, it's, if you ever play that game Snake and Ladders, it's like if you, you're playing Snake and Ladders and you land on a snake, you go back to the beginning. So they don't, if you don't have that shock at the certain point you need it, then you end up fizzling out. You lose the momentum and you go back to that base layer again. And you just start over. That's all it is. So we have to be cognizant of that because that's where sort of we run out of energy. You know, it's sort of like you have enough momentum to go, but you don't have enough energy to kind of bridge that gap. And so that's why um, he's saying that you need sort of external, or you need a boost of energy to get you through that. So I hope that makes sense. It is fairly esoteric. And it took me a long time to contemplate this. Uh, it, you can find this um, discussion at length in a book called In Search of the Miraculous, which I would highly recommend. It was written by um, P.D. Uspensky really, really good book. It's a little bit intellectual and it was written a hundred years ago. So the language is much more uh, complex than our language today, believe it or not. And they were smarter back then, I think, or at least um, they had more time for things. So they learned a lot more words. That's my theory, at least. So music and dance were the two main mechanisms because he said that those things there could put us back into sort of this flow of natural law. The other thing with music is that it is when we listen to music, we're absorbing those frequencies. And so if we're absorbing these frequencies that are created by somebody who's already got those pathways open, they're sort of lending us that energy to bridge the gap for ourselves. So I hope you see how music can help us bridge through these evolutionary gaps. But what I'm describing here is light years beyond what our society calls music. Seriously, the bar has been dumbed down so low. So after talking about that, let's go to the other end of the spectrum and let's look at modern music. This is what we get. And I'm sorry if you love Nicki Minaj or Vince Neil or any of these, but this, these are sort of the celebrity worship that happens in our society. So I have a question for you. If music has the power to bridge evolutionary gaps, what else could it do? What if it fell into the wrong hands? And what if it wanted to be used to limit consciousness as opposed to expand it? Well, you see, those vibrations have the same amount of power, have the same potential, but they're being directed in a very different way. And we've seen this in the degradation of music, and I've talked about this in length at various interviews. For me, it's a palpable experience. I cannot, I cannot listen to a lot of the mainstream modern music for this very reason, because it glorifies um, creating sort of this borderline primate level of consciousness that humans begin to exhibit and the glorification of the material. So it's very much in a way moving people back down into a form of imprisonment, into a form of unconsciousness, according to the ray of creation. Okay, but modern artists can and do create objective music. Um, when I was learning about this, I actually had two mentors that I would work with. And one of them, you know, he said he, was, he lived through the 60s and the 70s. He was actually Jim Morrison from The Doors. He was his next door neighbor. So he had some stories. But he said that the, what was happening in the 60s and 70s, um, and it was sort of accidental because a lot of people were taking drugs and they were experimenting with alternative lifestyles, but they accidentally tapped into the universal mind. And so for brief moments, certain artists were producing objective music. And some of them, like Leonard Cohen, were able to sustain that. And others, like Jimi Hendrix, they could sustain it and they could create these moments where a portal opened up and people were experiencing objective music and they were experiencing these ecstatic states, but unfortunately he couldn't hold that, you know, and he ended up overdosing and same with Janis Joplin here. And so some of them, you know, were able to maintain that. It's, it's a, it's a huge responsibility to be able to hold that. You know, here's a picture of the Eagles over here in the top left and the Eagles um, were very famous for a song called the hotel California. Now, 
I, I used to play that song a lot on the guitar. It was one of my favorite songs growing up to play. And singing those lyrics is about escaping the matrix, is about escaping the control system formed by the entertainment industry, formed by this lackadaisical, let's all just kind of party and not do anything in life. And they're pointing at something more. It's this allegory for this deep desire to break free. And so objective music doesn't have to be mathematically coded in a pyramid by Pythagoras or anything like that. Objective music can also be something that is naturally and spontaneously tapped into if people are in the right place with the right frequency and are vulnerable to it. Okay. So anyway, I think I've, uh, I've chatted about objective music there. Let's just see if there's any good questions. Okay, so Mauricio is asking, can we say we have to encounter the higher frequency to move on and tuning to that higher tone and raise our frequency and life is always looking for this to happen in the most efficient way? Life wants this to happen. That's my experience. And so life often presents us at those moments where there's sort of an obstruction or there's, there's something in the way. Life will provide those shocks. So we don't necessarily need to uh, go looking for them or digging them up. Um, but yes, many times it's, it's often the areas where we're holding on to something or we're restricted that our energy is compartmentalized and needs to be liberated to move into these higher states. Okay. Anyway, I'm going to bring Martin into the chat now and we're going to chat about, um, objective music, but in a very kind of different way. So I've got a little theme song for Martin here. Hello, Martin. Great to see you, man. And uh, thank you. you for joining me on this show. It's uh, it's always more fun when there's guests around. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So, how did you, did you see the presentation there? What do you think of objective music and this idea? Is this something that resonates with you? Absolutely, absolutely. Awesome. Man. And especially the more I go into ecstatic dance, into looking for music for ecstatic dance, teaching ecstatic dance it's like i can play none of the of the commercial music it's just yeah it's just uh yeah impossible but there is a lot of music that is like super high vibe that's that's uh yeah it's there's a lot out there it's just not screaming as much it's um you got to look for it right because it, i think it's more um that it's not the music that necessarily gets traction Right. Like if you dig into the entertainment industry, you'll see that the entertainment industry sort of favors that vibe that I was presenting on earlier, you know. And so these people aren't going to get record deals. They're going to have to do it on their own. But luckily in, in today's world, you know, if you have something good that people like and, and it captures some element of the cultural milieu, you can make it on YouTube. You can make it on, oh, I shouldn't say YouTube, but you can make it as being a creator. Yeah. Yeah, SoundCloud, Bandcamp, you, you uh, presented your album last week on Bandcamp. So that's that's a great resource to, to look into, definitely. Definitely. Um, but I really want to chat about ecstatic dance. And I hope if anyone has questions, please put them in the chat. because I'll, I'll call them up for Martin as well. But mm -hmm. the reason why is because especially in my study of objective music, it was always this combination of dance and sound together they were the thing that would create these awakened moments. So I guess what have you experienced th those moments for yourself? Is that what got you into becoming an ecstatic dance DJ? Um, um, I'll, I'll quickly explain my background around dancing. Mm -hmm. um, and then, and then I, I find back to the ecstatic dance um, music. So I'm from Austria and in Austria, it's very typical when you're like 16, 15, 16, 17, you go to dancing school and you learn the Viennese waltz and you learn all these ballroom dances. And yeah, my mom, when I was 15, she said, go to dance school. I actually didn't end up in dance school, but I ended up in, in, a, in a dance club where they, where they were teaching you how to dance at tournaments. So for almost 10 years, I've been dancing tournaments, ballroom and Latin, which, uh, yeah, like Viennese waltz, tango, slow waltz, also samba, rumba, cha-cha, 
all this kind of stuff, which is like very, the way they teach it is very um, brain heavy. So you have to learn the steps. You have like a very um, distinct movement that you do and you have your partner. Um, so so it's like it, it has nothing to do with the actual dance that you're talking about because your dance, I see a tribal dance. I see a tribe dancing around um, the fire. I see, um, um, yeah, a tribe, a tribe worshiping the sun. I see a tribe see praying and dancing for rain, for rain, that kind of dance. And I think in Western society, dance has been has been raped to become something that's very mental and that's very like strict and so on. But ecstatic dance is exactly what it what it says. It's about ecstasy. And for ecstasy, we don't need our brain. We need our heart. So ecstatic dance mm. is about connecting back to the heart. So that's that's one part. And the second one is for me, I came through music. I've always, I always loved music. And back then in the days, I'm pretty sure you remember, we had these racks of CDs. <laughs> so we didn't have thousands of tracks <laughs> on our phone, but we had CDs. And my father had like whatever, 30 CDs. So that was my, that was my, and he had dire straits and that kind of stuff. So music that has oh, a lot yeah. of melody, a lot of, lot of uh, guitar and, and uh, everything to it. Um, so my love for ecstatic dance came actually through the music mm. and yeah, then I started teaching ecstatic dance and I could see what, what people could go through. And only yeah. then I realized, or I started for myself to go into the dance deeper and deeper. So I kind of came from the, from the music side. It's interesting that, you know, our desires now is to go back to this tribal like way of dancing but i want to show you something here do you know what this is it's not sure ah here it is yes it's uh whirling dervishes uh, forever forever in a circle dancing but do you know did, did you know that the, <laughs> did you know that the counts that they do are not are they're kind of like Indian classical music where they're synchronized to the music in very complex ways. And so many of these ancient systems like the whirling dervishes or like some of the Greek dances like Eurythmy, which Vanessa studied, um, they're not tribal in the sense where they're spontaneous and organic. They're very mathematically precisely correlated. But it's interesting because that's not what we need now because our brains are already mathematical. Our brains are already going. So for us, we need to rewild first. We need to go back into this experience of being primal man, you know? And so I think that's where the excitement of ecstatic dance comes from. I think uh, what I've experienced with ecstatic dance, what I, I call it uh, dynamic yoga class. That's what it is for me <laughs> because uh, it's sort of spontaneously, I'm, I'm just sitting there listening to my body and I'm moving through these parts and I'm lubricating joints and opening up muscles. That's what I need to do because, um, in general, my body tightens. So mm -hmm. I need to open it up. And that for me is the, uh, physical somatic liberating experience that I get from ecstatic dance. I guess for everybody, they, they get their own medicine in whatever form it needs to arrive in. And, uh, what, what you just shared is also the beauty of ecstatic dance. When we drop out of our head and we drop into our heart, then the body knows what to move and how to move. And for me, every ecstatic dance is different. Sometimes I'm very internal. Sometimes I'm dancing with uh, the people. And, uh, yeah, I'm just, just moving joints and, and getting like all the stuck energy, um, getting rid of the stuck energy. It's a way of, of yes. getting rid of energy. And the way I always create the music for ecstatic dance, that's, that's also very interesting with uh, the scale is i give a long time at the beginning and this can be like 20 minutes for people to just get into that state of coherence to get into that state of of, of the heart to just get into that meditation and then the music like slowly picks up into kind of one or multiple waves and then we can get really into ecstasy and i'm talking about we're starting at 60 beats per minute and we're going up to 180 beats per minute so it's, wow. there's a broad range of 
of but a lot of this tribal music where they like didgeridoo and and drumming it's it's a lot of beats per minute and then at the end of course we we kind of uh, go back so that's that's one thing like really taking people on a journey so they can experience whatever um, they need to experience at the moment and the second one is that the songs i play one after the other they always they're always harmonic so i i overlap the songs quite a bit um most of the time and but they're always harmonic with each other and i try to go that they, through all you, the you use sympathetic keys so that when you hear one song coming exactly. in it isn't kind of coming in at a dissonant yeah exactly exactly so that's awesome. that's super important uh, to me and if i don't do that i explicitly do that because i want to wake people up yeah i, I create this dissonance to like hey well, what's what's going on now <laughs> mm. but most of the time and you just see it when people are on the channel you just you just you only need to support that channel you need to yeah. create that fire it's it's part of the alchemy right it's like this fire this heat to to burn whatever's not not necessary anymore and we go i most of the time go through all the different notes so i go from c basically back to c uh maybe sometimes multiple times so whatever is in you whatever whatever frequency is stuck in you whatever energy is stuck in you this the this, this we go through through all the uh, notes of a scale so it can at some point something will resonate with you and it will like yeah. wake you up and shake you up and hey martin what do you think of this idea of um what i was showing with the major scale where mm -hmm. c d e and then there's this gap you know so it's sort of like you could almost play with that like go c d e back you know and a lot of um music does that like da 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 da, da and then it takes a few before they break through and so mm -hmm. it is replicating sort of this natural progression of entering into a different evolutionary bandwidth definitely and i also uh read and funny i have the book i read it in it's below my laptop to lift the laptop a little bit uh -huh. <laughs> so and it's the flower of life by trumbalo melchizedek and what he's oh, uh, yeah. i'm not sure if i'm if i'm pronouncing him right but uh, you said us so i guess you you know who it is <laughs> uh -huh. um and he basically explained like C is uh, correlated with our root chakra, D with the second chakra, E with the third chakra. And then there is this, and that's that's like all our root needs, all, all our basic needs like money, sexuality, um, and, and that uh, kind of stuff. And then there is this gap between third chakra and heart chakra. Exactly. And so that's, that's exactly. a very interesting one because like the, i think it's 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 hard to to bridge that gap from our lower needs to come into our heart and become heart centered in what we're if, doing if you look at this this does replicate sort of the traditional chakra layout this is your root this is your sacral that's your solar plexus but to get from the because if, if i think about root sacral solar plexus what is that energy root is the physical grounded sacral is the lower emotional relational the solar plexus is the actually the mind and the will but the heart is the higher is the start in the beginning of our higher intelligence mm -hmm. right but there's a gap you know m moving between and um Gurdjieff had, had a saying for this he called it man number one two or three man number one was sort of the bricklayer types you know they just go out and they do hard labor man number two was the ordinary sort of um performer entertainer swindler charlatan and man number three was the scientist or the intellectual but man number four was the beginning of a awakened man where he moved into the heart and so it's very interesting because it's almost like you know the gravity of your consciousness does sort of ascend up this column and so many of the the great spiritual traditions talk about that you know the, the whether it's the awakening of kundalini or the awakening of ka energy but it's interesting to see that you know you can uh stimulate that with sound stimulate definitely. that with music definitely yeah and it's also like I, I do ecstatic dance but i also play the gong and i think the gong is like one of the most powerful instruments to to it, it basically does its magic by itself once yeah. you know how to how to play the gong and playing the gong <clears throat> sorry playing the gong basically means to to listen to the gong how it wants to be played by you so you uh -huh. don't you don't play the gong you just 
you just uh, stroke it wherever it wants to be stroked. But the the power of this instrument is that it, it's it's said to be second to the human voice in the in the um, in, in the sounds it can produce, and we are all energy, so it produces so much that whatever stuck energy in our body attaches to it and gets like freed through the gong. So it's a beautiful tool or for me, like it was love, it was love at first listen the gong. It was like an amazing uh, epiphany insight. And um, um, yeah, so the, the gong can also do exactly the same, but yeah, frequency at the end of the day. Beautiful. Uh, I'm, I'm glad you touched on the gong because that was one thing I've noticed. You know, Vanessa and I, we used to work at the same place, basically. We worked at the Pyramids of Chi with you guys. <laughs> True. You know, so same, sa same line of business. But the gongs and some of those instruments, they would just wash sound over you. And it would just basically decongest stuck life force in the body, mm -hmm. right? And the gong sort of has this tendency because it uh, takes up such a broad range on the frequency spectrum to just hit anything you need anything you need to sort of work with it but a gong master is somebody who could precisely know which particular ones to focus on mm -hmm. and and for me it's um it's there is a physical phenomenon to also like bring it bring it back to a to a science perspective i always love that um there is this uh, uh, physical phenomenon of energy entrainment. And it was first discovered by Christian Higgins, I think. I don't know if I, if I pronounce him right, but he was the inventor of the pendulum clock. So what, oh, what yes. he That was in the, the 1700s, right? And then yes, Hans, yes, yes, I can't yes. remember. Hans, yeah, because he, did you hear the story of how he discovered it with the clocks? Yes, yes, yes. That's what I'm about to share. It's like, <laughs> it's like uh, very, very random, but I guess uh, like um, these random discoveries are what, what uh, create these leaps and steps in, in, in our evolution. And um, so what, what he did, I think he was sick or something, and uh, he was just at home and like um, starting all of his pendulum clocks. And obviously as the invent of the pendulum clock, he had like... Um, quite a few at home and he started them and he realized within a few minutes um, all of them had the same tick so he started them completely random and they had all the same tick and it was like what's what's going on here and what the physical phenomenon of energy entrainment is is that whatever the strongest energy in the room is um, in physics everything tries to use the least energy possible so they're just attaching to the strongest energy in the room and I think we experience that when you come in, when, when you are in a room and someone with super bad mood comes in, like the whole room drops and someone with super high mood comes in, the whole room uplifts. So it's, it's also something that we can experience. Well, metaphysics mirrors physics, right? Yeah, I mean, exactly. Exactly. You, it's as, it's, as a, it's below, a, right? a social phenomena so much as it is a physical phenomena. Definitely. And um, yeah, I think the, the gong is basically doing the same. The gong is like such a strong instrument that your body, your energies, your stuck energies just attach to it and, and start vibrating with it. That's, that's the way, like one of the explanations um, I have for that phenomenon. And I mean, we had like, we, we all had hundreds of sessions of, of gong and sound and it, it, it happened like every time. So it's, it's pretty, um, yeah, it's just happening. Yeah. We got some questions in the chat if you'd like to answer a couple yes, questions because sure, they're definitely relevant. <laughs> so a real easy one for you. Um, okay. Susan's asking, what is ecstatic dance? So just to kind of back <laughs> up, if somebody hasn't heard of it, why don't you give them in your own words what ecstatic dance is? Mm -hmm. Ecstatic dance, I would say, is in a very free, it's a very free form dance. So there is no need to know any steps, to know anything about dance. And you can, even if you're like um, partly like paralyzed, or if you can't use one leg or anything, anyone can do ecstatic dance. It's just about tuning in with the music. It's about tuning in with your heart and let the body just, the body and the music in conjunction just do what's, what's necessary for you. So it's a very free form way of 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 movement of movement inspired 
by by music. It's a very yeah. short explanation. <laughs> it's a great explanation, though. I think you really hit the nail on the head. Um, somebody else is asking here. She's like, Martin, can you share some of your ecstatic dance playlists? <laughs> yes, I have all of them on SoundCloud, and I think you can you can put the the links um, in uh, YouTube, right? Oh, I, I'll comments. add them to the description after, but if they want to search you on SoundCloud, do you have a handle I can put up on the screen? Um, yes, let me, I can give that to you here. Wait, here it is. I can, my, okay, I sent to you in the private chat. Oh, wait, for some reason, I cannot hear you now. Can you still hear me? Are you muted? Oh, sorry, I just hit my mute button. Ah, okay. <laughs> cool. So I'm going to, just for now, I'll put this in the de description later. But um, basically, this is, if you're going on SoundCloud, soundcloud.com slash DJ dash Merlin dash the dash Lion Wizard. Such a cool name. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad Teacher Merlin was already taken, so I had to come up with something else. And Leo is my star sign, so I was like, yeah, I'll, I'll add that as well. That's amazing. Well, um, Martin, I think we could talk forever about this. And a lot of you're getting a lot of love in the chat right now, too. A lot of people are basically saying, good to see you. Yes, mm -hmm. five rhythms. So there are a lot of Thank people you. who are up on their ecstatic dance in the chat. Um, but thank you so much for stopping in and having a nice little chat. And please do check out some of his uh, his SoundCloud, his playlists. I definitely will. I'm going to be doing some ecstatic dance tonight in my living room. <laughs> uh, but before we go, I did actually want to play a piece. Um, I have an album launch that's coming out on Friday. And I think I told Martin about this too. And so there's a documentary about this. And then there's an album that follows the documentary. And some of the songs in this album were given to me by some of these old school, like from the 70s teachers of sort of um, objective music. And so these lyrics are about inner alchemy. They're about transformation. And I worked with them. And I'm actually going to play you one of these today as we go. As you know, I love to um, leave us with something to uh, brighten our day. So I'm going to play us a song that we can listen to on the way out. And I'm just getting it up here. So this will be, uh, this will take us out for the, for the end here. Uh, but thank you very much for joining us, Martin. And I'm going to play you, again you for having awesome me music to listen to on the way out. So thank you very looking much for joining Looking forward to me. more. Yes, yes. And we're looking forward to having you back, by the way, and also getting some of your live stream DJ sets that's one of the things we want to do with Octave Leap. Martin is a very good friend of ours. I mean, he's part of the family, really. Mm. Um, so we want to have him on talking about some of his other skills because he's a, a man of many skills. And, of course, we want him to be DJing just like we do live streams, just like we do hangouts and crypto sessions. I mean, this is part of the experience. This is part of building a new earth is all these different parts of us. So at some point in time, Martin will be ready. And he'll have uh, be able to do some live streaming of ecstatic dance for us all. Looking very much forward to that. Yes. Until then, this is called "The Alchemist Said" from the upcoming album. So I'll leave you with this for today.